to turn it over to, I'm going to turn it over to Deborah, who will speak on behalf of the Levison family. Thank Debbie, you need very yeah. As many of you know, to sit in the shiur with Sybil is to be awed by her intelligence and erudition, the breadth of her knowledge, her incisive understanding and articulate insights, her meticulous attention to language, her pleasure in learning. Having first picked up a Gemara around the age of 12, Sybil has been a staple of weekly Talmud, sh Talmud shiurim at the Young Israel of Brookline for more than 30 years, spends three weeks learning in Jerusalem most years, and is part of the core of Rabbi Jaffe's Gemara class from Mayan. Sybil's love of Torah is wide ranging. She can be regularly found learning in any number of shirim taking place, in shul, at Mayan, online. Following in her own father's footsteps, she has set an example that, a, that ripples down the generations and has afforded her the zchut and the nachat of sitting in Batei Midrash with her grandchildren. As a founding board mem member of Mayan 28 years ago, she was part of a group who successfully brought text-based Torah learning to women and later men too in Boston, and she continues to work hard to keep Mayan strong and thriving. One of the people Sybil most enjoys learning from while in Israel is Rabbanit Gila Rosen. How fortunate we are that technology has allowed us to sit and learn together despite the geographic distance. We can't think of a better way to honor our mother. Rabbanit Gila, thank you for being with us. Please. No pleasure. Maria, should I get started? Right. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much, family of Sybil. Thank you so much. A uh, couple of you I know, others I don't. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of her birthday. What a wonderful, wonderful way to celebrate a birthday. What a wonderful idea. And um, I hope that I say enough provoking things to make it uh, um, something very alive. Uh, and I also want to thank you for choosing the subject which was most challenging. I gave you a few choices and you chose the most challenging among the subjects, um, which I, a subject which I had thought about, I thought I had thought about it, but I hadn't really explored and uh, had a wonderful time uh, exploring it for this year. Uh, the, the fact that the source sheet only arrived this morning was the product of my constantly uh, rethinking what I thought I had thought about before. So I really want to thank you very much for inviting me to be part of your Simcha Sibyl and to uh, celebrate in a way one can even do in the nine days. Uh, and thank you very much, all of you. And uh, I, hope, I hope we'll have this good time together. Now I've asked for Ilana. I also want to give a big thank you to Ilana, who's been just wonderful at getting back to me and asking and answering whatever I needed to arrange. So thank you very much, Ilana. And Ilana's agreed to do the share screen. The reason for that is whoever does the share screen gets to see only a few people on the side. And one of the advantages of the screen today is that I can see most of you. And so I don't want to be the one who puts the uh, sources up on the share screen because I can minimize them and see most of you. So um, you can all use the share screen as much as you want. Most of the sources are Rashi on the Chumash. So if you have a Chumash with Rashi, you actually will hardly need to use uh, the source sheet. So I want to explore something. Again, please feel comfortable if I've lost you to interrupt. Put your hand up or interrupt or put it on the chat. Um, because if I lost you, I probably lost somebody else as well. So I want to start by saying that my, my perception of what to do about this piece about Benot Slavchat has just constantly uh, developed over the last, well, a long time, but especially over the last few weeks when I've been working on it. My question was, are they relevant? Is this story relevant for questions of development of halacha that we have today? Right? Today we have all sorts of questions and questionings of structures. Naomi, did you want to say something? Yes. No, it's okay. Uh, of structures, why are the structures the way they are? Can they be changed? How does it, how does change work? Should they be changed? 
how much of a voice does the individual have? And my question was, to what extent is this story of Benot Slavchad helpful to us? To what extent is it is it similar in kinds of ways that can be useful to us? And to what extent is it not really, not really relevant? Um, so what I want to do is start off with a pshat version of the story, very literal reading of the story. And then I want to crack that uh, literal reading. I, I want to see how far the literal reading gets us. And then I want to crack it. Uh, and I want to crack it with feminist readings by Chazal themselves. Because what we need to look at is, how does this story appear in the Chumash? And how does it appear in Chazal, in the Gemara and in books of Midrash? How are they perceiving the story? And what does that mean for uh, understanding how they're perceiving what Halacha can do? Okay, so I want to start with a little reading and then I want to break away from that. So we'll put maybe the first 20 minutes, half an hour, on a relatively literal reading. So I need you here to use your chumashim. And I want to start with the story of Benot Slavchad, as it appeared uh, two Shabbatot ago in Parshat Pinchas. That's Numbers, Bamidbar, chapter 27, Kaf Zayin. Um, whatever chumash you like, use that one. So, the story appears and pretty familiar that Batikravna Benot Slavchad, Ben Chaifa, Ben Gila, Ben Machi, Ben Masha, etc., etc. And these are their names. And verse two, they stand before Moshe and Elazar Kohen and they say, Avinu, verse three, Avinu made Pamidba. Our father died in the desert and he wasn't in the, the, the Korach's group. We won't deal with the question, what was his sin? What did he do wrong? We're going to leave that out. We're going to leave his Slavkad's biography out because I want to focus on his doings. Verse 4. Lama yigara shem avinu mitoch mishpachto ki ein lo bein. Tna lanu achuza betoch ache avinu. And here I would like participation. Lama yigara shem avinu. Why should the name of our father, not sure what's the best English, lose out? Lotos Sif, you have the mitzvot, Balto Sif and Balto Grad, not to add on and not to uh, take out some of them. Why should it lose out? Why should it be taken away? Somebody has got a better translation. I'm open. Just put it on the table for all of us. Lama Yigara Shem Avinu. Why should our father's name Get lost. Ki em lo ben, because he has no. Be diminished. Thank you very much. John is very good. Be diminished. Yes, absolutely. That's what happens when you live in Israel. You have no English anymore. You don't have Hebrew and you don't know English either anymore. Why should his name be diminished? Excellent. Give us uh, uh, an inheritance. Yes, give us a peace among the brothers of our father. Okay, the father had died. Whole discussion in the Gemara, according to what is the decision of who gets a piece? Is it who came out of Egypt? Who's there now? Doesn't matter. He's supposed to get a piece as one of the people who came out of Egypt and who didn't die for what reason he shouldn't get a piece. And he has no sons to be given uh, the piece. How does this question sound to you? Forget anything you read, learned in school or Rashi or anything. Lama Yigara Shem Avinu, Tla Lanu Achuza. How does it sound? Anybody? Zelo Fair. Zelo Fair. Zelo Fair. Yofi, who said that? Deb Cram. Okay, thank you. Zelo Fair, absolutely. Doesn't sound like the demanding. Naomi, yes, demanding. It's quite demanding. They've got a, a problem. They, the wording for the problem is not genteel, not gentle or genteel. And they've got their solution ready. Give us a piece. Right? Um, it's, it's, it's not the sort of question you necessarily would think would get a positive reply. And it gets a very positive reply. Moses says, 
but it doesn't say what he says right away. He takes their question before God, and God says, Cain wrote their right, gives them a piece. So Moses does not know the answer. He, he goes before God, he brings their question before God. Pretty amazing to be able to do that. And he gets an answer. And here the question is, how relevant is this for us today? Because that's not the process of halacha today exactly. That, you know, you have a question and you go to the nearest posek and he says to you, oh, hang on a few minutes. I'll just check it out with God. So there isn't, it's a different kind of process. Okay. So we have to look, if we want just a basic interpretation, what we see is that a question that seemed to us a little pushy was actually accepted, totally accepted, okay? Um, now we had to look at this in the context of the book of Bamidbar. What's going on in the book of Bamidbar? The book of Bamidbar is an interesting book. I used to find it difficult to connect to until recently. It's a book about, really about structure and deconstruction. It's completely, it starts up with the structures. Where does everybody live? Count everybody. Where are they organized? What's everybody's job? But it's full of questioning of the structure. For instance, after we've got all the stuff about Kohanim and Levim, we have the Nazir or Nazira who says, actually, I'd like to live a specially holy life connected to God. And we even have a question in the Gemara, who takes precedence if there's a dead person and there's nobody else to take care of them? And there's a Kohen there and a Nazir or a Nazira there. Who should take care of the dead person? The Kohen or the Nazir or Nazira who took it upon themselves. So we have very clear structures and then deconstruction. We have people saying, no, actually, no, we want something else. Uh, actually, I'd like to be in Nazir. Is that possible? Yes, it is. So we have a lot of interesting, um, and we have questions like questioning like Korach, which is not accepted at all. Right, a rebellion, which is not accepted. So, if we look at it in terms of, of that, we have this question. It's not the only time in, in the in the safer that somebody questions. And in a deed, at the end of yesterday's laning, what did we have? Kind of disappointment. What happened at the end of yesterday's laning? It was a little disappointing. Along came the 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 men from Menashe, the last chapter of the book. Lamed Zayin, the, the Vav, la, the last chapter, and they said, this is not fair. They're again with the not fair. This is not going to work. These women are going to get, God said they can inherit if they're no sons. Well, great. And then what happens? They get married to men from the, another tribe, and look what happens. Our tribal area, after all, we just had all the description about how the land is going to be di di divided according to tribe. Our area is going to go off to somebody else's and we're going to have pockets of other tribes inside our tribe or pieces yes because those women are going to get married to somebody else and they're gonna uh, we, we're going to be lost and what does god say no nope. what does god say you can unmute yourself and say what does god say Mary, they have to marry Cain, Benamate, Bene Yosef, Dovrim. Yeah, they're right too. You're right. He's right. You're all right. Okay. This caused the problem. We're going to fix that problem. How are we going to fix it? If you get, if you inherit land, stay and marry somebody in your own tribe. Okay. So we have one pull and then another pull back. I've given you now a shot reading um, of the story. It's not Chazal's reading of the story at all, but it is a, Decent shot, I think. Now, in this shot reading, I think that women have done something that is seen as positive uh, because um, they did it for their father's sake. That's what it says, our father's name. And I think they're believed. They are believed. Now, Chazal are going to read it exceedingly positively, more positively than I just read it. Um, and one of the reasons I think is because Bamidbo is a chiastic book. Um, that's an idea I first heard from Mary Douglas, actually, in England. Uh, but it is indeed a chiastic book. I don't agree with everything she says about it, but or said, but uh, it is indeed. In the sense that things from the first part of the book are reflected later. So, for instance, everybody's counted at the beginning of the book, and then everybody's counted at the end of the book. There's all discussion about where everybody should live around the Mishkan at the beginning of the book, and there's a discussion of who lives where in Eretz Israel 
at the end of the book. So the book has reflections. And if we look, we can see that this phrase, Lama Yigamra Sheim Avinu, actually is a mirror image of another Nigara, and that is in chapter nine. So if you flip back to Bamidba chapter nine, the beginning of the, of the chapter, what do we have? We have another bunch of people who say not fair. Who are these? This is the story of Pesach Sheni. Moshe comes and tells them there's going to be Pesach. This is Perakteh, chapter 9 of Bamibah. And people who were um, Tme'im, who are impure and can't bring the Korban Pesach, what do they say? They don't say, well, that's halacha, you know. <laughs> some mitzvahs you can do sometimes, and some mitzvahs you can do other times. And you can't always do all the mitzvahs. And if you're Tme'i because you took care of a dead person, then now you can't do this mitzvah, but you did a different mitzvah. And they don't say, well, that's something that makes sense. No, they don't. They say, why should I lose out? Why should we lose out on this amazing experience of bringing Korban Pesach together with everybody? That's what they say. La chapter 9, uh, verse um, 7, Zion. What have we got? No, 9, yes, 7. Yes. 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 Why should we, uh, should we use the word diminish again? Why should our rights be diminished? Why should we lose out? Yes, to be unable to bring the Korban Pesach. And it's really quite a funny sentence because they've just explained why they're losing out. They're losing out because they're Tmeim. But it, they're not saying, why are we losing out? They know exactly why, but why should we lose out as a result of it? And uh, Chazal are quite surprised by the question because not very logical. And uh, they suggest, why did they ask that? Because they were to made to do a mitzvah. They were taking care of somebody who was there to do a mitzvah. Why should a mitzvah make me lose out? Maybe that was their problem. Or maybe it was just they so don't want to lose out. Or maybe it was, they, they suggest, that by the evening they were already going to be finishing being to make, And so they would only be to make in the afternoon. Why can't they join and eat the korban together? with you? But it's a kind of surprising question, actually. But that's what they, they ask. And it's the same phrase. Lama Nikara and Lama Yigara. Why should we lose out? Why should his name be diminished? Or why should he lose out? Um, but it's clear that the reason that they're asking it in the case of Korban Beisach was a good motivation. What did they want to do altogether? What are they saying they, they don't want to lose out about? They don't want to have lose out on the chance to bring Korban Beisach. So it's a clearly a good motivation. Mind you, not everybody today, maybe that's a good point to say, that wanting to do a mitzvah that you're part of from is a good motivation. The Torah sees it as a wonderful motivation, a valid and good motivation. You wanted to do the mitzvah together with, the, to, with other people. What your answer will be, the answer will be here, no, you can't. You'll get another opportunity. And the question that sort of hangs over us is, and what if they wouldn't have asked, would there have been Pesach Sheni anyway? And that's the wonderful question, the tantalizing question. And it very much disturbs Chazal. What would have been if these people wouldn't have asked? Right? Would Pesach Sheni have been anyway, and it was just waiting to come into the world through somebody who asked for it? Or would there have been no? Or would there would not have been had they not asked? Right? Uh, so that's one of the questions that hangs here. But the story of the women who are asking of Benot Slavchad is seen as kind of parallel to this story here. They're also seen as their motivation was very positive. I think Chazal, Chazal can't not do that. Medrash has to do that. It sees a phrase that's a, a mirror image of another phrase and will always say, this story is connected. It's similar in some kind of way. So they're both stories which are asking, hey, why is halacha working out like that? But they're not seen as people who are saying, oh, uh, I don't care. On the contrary, they're people who so want something inside. They want to be inside. Okay? So that's the first thing that people are seen as wanting to be inside. Now here I'd like to ask if um, 
Ilana, if you could put the, the sources up on the screen. Those of you who have a chumash with Rashi, for most of the time can use that if you prefer, whatever you prefer. Now here's the source sheet. And um, if you could put it so we can see the first two sources. So if you can um, maybe move it up a bit. Ilana, yeah. And uh, is it large enough for people or do people need a bigger? Okay, the first one, uh, Milani went a little too far. Moved it down. There you go. Okay. Um, do people need it larger? Can you do it yourself? So does she need, the, is, it, is it large enough? Let's see. Yeah, I think it's, it's is it big enough? Are you okay? Because I'm making it small on the side because I'm using my own page so I can see it. Okay. I sort of, uh, Cheated a bit because I couldn't be bothered to read all the names, but let's go back to Parshat Pinchas to the verse. You need your chumash as well. And what did it say when it was introducing um, the Benot Slavchad? What did it say? Ben Chayfer, Slavchad is Ben Chayfer, Ben Gilad, Ben Machir, Ben Menashe, Lemishpachot Menashe Ben Yosef. That's an awfully long inter introduction. And uh, Chazal wants to know why such a long introduction. Lama Nemar, why do we need Lemishpachot Menashe ben Yosef at the end? Balo Kvar Nemar ben Menashe. Okay, we got to Menashe. Ela lo ma'alacha. Yosef chibay v'ta'aretz. Yosef loved the land of Israel. How do we know that? Because he said, v'halitem et atzmotai mizeh. He, he told them, the, the brothers, please make sure that my bones will be taken from Egypt back to Israel. U'benotav chibabu et and his daughters love the land. So why do we mention this long uh, genealogy to get back to Yosef to say these women are like Yosef? What, in what way are they like Yosef? In other words, some genealogy that just looked boring. No, no, it's there for a purpose. It's to tell us that these women are similar to Yosef. They take after him in that they want Eretz Yisrael. It matters to them. Somebody else could say, what do I care? We'll get to the, go further that with that soon. But they cared about having a place in Eretz Israel. That they were great people. If you have somebody, and we don't really, can't really tell from the story if he's a very positive character or not, watch and see who he's connected to. If they Tell them, oh, and they go all the way up to Yosef, then they wanted to tell you these, were, these women were positive, very positive figures. And they were, their motivation was good, their reasoning was good, they were very positive figures. So from this little genealogy, they get the sense that they're very positive people, figures, and that uh, they love Israel. And this is coming from a love of Israel. In the same way as in the Korban Pesach, it's coming from wanting to bring the Korban Pesach with everyone. This is coming from wanting to get into Israel. Ki ein lo ba, ben. Second one here is that they say, um, what do they say? Lama yigo Hashem avinu, ki ein lo ben. So now, now they've already said ein lo ben and the first before that, right? It said, ki chlet abayit, uvanim lo hayu lo. Lama yigo Hashem avinu mitok mishpah, ki ein lo ben. They repeat it. Why did they repeat it? Ha'im ha'yalo ben lo hayu tovot klum. Magit shachachmaniot ayu. Now, the, actually, the laws of who gets what inheritance have not been explained yet. It's just their assumption that it's the men because the men are being counted and there's a discussion of which tribes are where. But in actual fact, Moses hasn't explained the laws of inheritance yet. Nevertheless, they get the impression correctly that it will go to the sons and that he's going to lose out or they wonder, will he lose out? And therefore they say, give, give us the peace. All right. So here's Chazal saying they're smart. They've got good motivation. They're positive figures and they hark back to Yosef. Okay. Now Chazal have the problem. How come Moshe didn't know? Now, you and I could say that's not really a problem that he didn't know. So what if he didn't know? Maybe God hadn't explained that yet. 
But there's a machloket, a difference of opinion between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva as to what Moshe was doing for 40 days on Mount Sinai. Rabbi Ishmael says he was learning the, the basics of all the laws he was going to teach later. And Rabbi Akiva says, no, he was learning it with the details as well. If you look at the beginning of Rashi, at the beginning of Parsha Bahar, for instance, he has a discussion about that there. So if Moshe was supposedly learned everything, why doesn't he know the answer now? But really, in Pshat, you could have a different answer, which is he doesn't know, he doesn't have to know. But the problem is that the women are right. And, and why hasn't he figured that out? So he didn't. He didn't know. It's an exception. He doesn't know. But according to the way the mainstream Chazal are looking at things, he should know. And therefore we ask, what would happen if they didn't ask? Why doesn't he know the answer? Does it reflect badly on him or exceedingly well on them? That's our options, really, if we think that that law is hanging, is there, hanging in the air till they come around, then it's got to reflect on one of them. So Ilana, can you scroll down for us to the third, please? Okay. Here it is. I'm bringing you as much as possible the Rashi's. In the end of the Rashi, it actually tells you the source. Rashi's based himself for most of the discussion, mostly on two sources the Sifrei, and the Gemara in Baba Batra. The Gemara in Baba Batra, which discusses property, has a few pages about this piece. And the Sifrei, which is a midrash, an early midrash, which quotes Tanaim. In other words, and it was composed a little after the time, in the century after the Mishnah, is follows verse by verse. So these are the two main sources. I brought them the way Rashi brings them, at least at the beginning, because that way, Safaria had them punctuated and translated, whereas not everything else uh, was punctuated and translated. And I thought, it's just a lot easier to read it like that. Also, because if you want to, you can open your Chumash and find it in your own Chumash. Okay, the, the Gemara and the uh, um, posits in, in two places, Baba Batra and in Sanhedrin, posits two theories as to why Moshe didn't know and they did. It's actually also um, the Sifrei we'll talk about. The first theory is, Nitalma halacha mimenu, v'chan nifra al shenatal atara loma v'adabar sheyikshemikem takrivun alai. On the one hand, Moses was anav mikol adam. He was humble, more humble than any human being. I suppose an encounter with God makes you realize just what it means to be human. It must be a real encounter with God that must create real humility. Or maybe a really humble person's got space for God. I don't know which came first or how, the, how it gets move, the movement there. In any case, nevertheless, at the beginning of the book of Devarim, when he's talking about uh, nominating judges, he talks about that he said to them, whatever's hard for you, takrivun alai ushmativ and I will hear it. But here he was punished for saying that phrase, if it's too hard for you, bring it to me. Even though afterwards he says, I will hear it. And it's not clear what he means. I'll hear it from you or I'll go ask God like he actually does. The other argument in the Gemara says, no, no, no. He didn't do anything wrong. On the contrary, he said, if it's too hard for you, come to me and I'll ask God. That was just how it worked. Ru'uya, no, the reason that he doesn't know the answer now is completely different. It could have been written. It ought to have been written, this piece, by a Moshe. He would have just taught it. Ela shazachu benot slavchad v'nichtava al yadan. They merited to be able to do this, to bring this into the world. It was their merit. They, zachu. I don't like merited with zachu. If somebody has a better word, just throw it out, put it on the table. Um, but they, they merited, they had that opportunity that this halacha came into the world through them, through their wanting their father to have a share 
or maybe through other motivations we will see, it came through them and it was, it waited, it was hanging there. You'll see it wasn't only hanging. And Hashem purposely didn't tell it to Moshe, not to punish him, not to make him feel small, but in order to give it a chance for that halacha to come into the world through them. Okay, so if we now take a look at where we've got to um, till now, what have we got? We've got a situation where Chazal is suggesting that the world of responsa, of she'ilot and shuvot, starts now. It's quite interesting. In English, they're called responsa. But in Hebrew, the method of, of, of learning halacha and halacha getting applied is actually called she'ilot and shuvot, questions and answers, or shutim, the short version, which is situations where Someone comes and asks the question. Some one of us asks and says, wait a minute, this is a problem for me, or this is a problem for my generation, or I don't know how this fits in, or what do we do now that the disabled, thank God, have many possibilities they didn't have before, and should halacha be different now in certain ways? All kinds of questions that come up. Has the society changed? Has uh, uh, things physically change, have people grown in certain kinds of ways. How does halacha develop? Even already in the time of Moshe, what happens? God, according to this, holds back something. Holds back something. Why? In order, um, uh, in order to give a chance for people to learn to ask, to create the validity of asking. Okay, I, I can't. Somebody's put in a very interesting chat, but we'll keep it for the discussion time at the end. Okay, so hold on to it. So I'm suggesting that the validity, that this establishes the validity of questioning. In other words, even they, it was valid. And God, according to this, holds back on the peace in order to establish this validity and give it a chance for the, for, uh, uh, a halacha, a very major halacha, to enter the world via them, like it did with Pesach Sheni, to enter the world via the people who actually questioned the structure. And that was fine. Um, let's go on uh, to the next, to number four. Number four is even stronger, right? Ilana, I need to ask you to scroll down. Correctly, Rashi says, Ye'ut, appropriately. And then he quotes two pieces. Uh, the, the, um, the original piece is from the Sifrei. The word Tanchuma appears because the explanation to the original piece is uh, from the Tanchuma, which is later. Um, Right, I see a chat suggesting there were some things he knew and some he didn't. Um, that is a very interesting idea. Chazal suggests that. Um, uh, it's appropriate what they've said. And then there's an amazing phrase. I suggest that the halacha was hanging. No, no, no. Kach ktuva pasha zu lefanai bamaron. So this pasha is written before me in heaven. Ilan, I need to ask you to scroll down. If you could do so, please. Okay, perfect. Magid Shev Now that's that's from the Sifre, the early Medrash. And then there's a later Medrash, the Tanchuma, that explains it more. Magid Shevra'ata Einan, Mashalo Ra'ata Eino Shel Moshe. It suggests their I saw what Moses' eye did not see. And uh, um the Safaria translation suggested that what that mean is, many means is they had a finer perception of what was just in the law of inheritance than Moses had. All right, I'll go with that. That the eye saw, I was actually quite happy to imagine their eye seeing it. You know, you see something that someone else doesn't have access to, and they have access to it, which is a sense that there should be a difference here. 
they see something that Moses himself uh, doesn't see. This Pasha is already written. It's there. Moses wasn't told it exactly, so he couldn't um, get to it uh, by some sort of form of logic or um, how do you say when you when you uh, you study you learn something by adding on to it by going forward with it like moving outward rather than moving inward induction yes Moses didn't get to it by any form of induction and they did they saw something so either they they saw it or they sensed it or they actually came to it logically and we'll see discussions of that okay and then we have Further, Rashi, Rashi goes on and quotes another piece of Medrash. If you could scroll down further, Ilana, came notes the the second one. Very good, thank you. Yafetavu ashrei ha'adam adam she'akodesh baruchu model edvarav. Which is just beautiful. Happy is the person whose words the Holy One, with whose words the Holy One, blessed be he. Agrees. So Rashi brings two ideas. Oh, two. How fortunate for them that God agrees with them. What a wonderful situation to be in that a human being has an idea and God says, yes, that's a good idea. We don't mostly have a chance to find out. And the sec and the first one was, as Rashi put it there, in the opposite order in the Midrash, that they saw what was there written already in God's Torah. I don't know in what way God's Torah is written, fire and fire, just ideas, that it was there. Okay. So, we pause there again. We've created a scenario in which Hazal see the questioning as incredibly positive because their assumption is that this law already was supposed to come into the world and that it comes into the world through these women. And here, um, I need to bow to the world of Rav Kook, even though I grew up in the world of Rav, Rav Soloveitchik, where in the literary world, where there's Yuri Dato the Rot, each generation is less than the previous one, et cetera, et cetera. But in the world of Rav Kook, he talks about that, uh, that in the world of ideas, at least, different ideas were meant to come into the world at different times in history. So that certain things, for instance, the uh, the um, Kabbalah of the of the Ari, which is not the same as the Zohar, was meant to come into the world with him. The society, culture, whatever, wasn't ready for that idea. Now, this is in certain ways terribly, terribly important idea because what it's saying is there are certain isms of the twentieth and twenty first century, and some of them have great positive things which are meant to come into the world and could only come in. In other words, feminism may have some downsides, but it can, may have some very positive sides that were meant to the, come into the world and only could come into the world at a certain point. And then the question comes, comes maybe certain halachot can only come into the world at certain points. So for instance, Rav Nachman Binowitz would argue that although uh, slavery was tolerated in the Chumash. If you read the Chumash properly, you can see that the arrow is toward stopping slavery. And in fact, among the Jewish people, it stopped earlier than in the world around them, or generally stopped earlier. That there are certain ways in which the Chumash gives you arrows, but there are certain things that will need to come about. So these women needed to question it. It, did, it needed to come through them rather than through Moshe. And Certain things may come through us. The, the learning we are doing now, in some ways, society wasn't ready, or women weren't in a position. Many people were illiterate altogether, never mind women in the olden time, were not in a position to do this kind of learning. And so it is coming into the world all the time. With Zoom, a whole other thing came into the world. Yes, Zoom, but there was a possibility for different kinds of learning to enter the world at different periods of time. Okay, but the process itself is, is, is not so clear because the process is so different. Moshe Rabbeinu can go and ask God and then we can be pretty sure he got it right. Whereas we can't do anything of the sort. So what happens in terms of process and uh, what happens in terms of motivation? So here I would like to uh, suggest 
three different levels of feminist reading of this piece, except the feminist reading is done by Chazal. Except today, I think we would call it feminist readings of the story. And it's so interesting that it's Chazal who do these readings. Okay, so the first one is number five here. Ube'ele lo ha'yaish. Okay, we said that the women loved Eretz Yisrael, but we didn't really focus on it. What's this verse, Uve'ele lo ha'yaish? It's the end of the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, all the men are counted, right? And then it says, Uve'ele lo ha'yaish mipkudei Moshe va'aron ha'kohen, because God said, there were no, no, there was no man left from the original count. Why not? Because God had said they're going to die in the desert. ish, and there was no man left except Kaleb and Yahshua bin Nun. Now, I can read this very simply. It's talking about the men because those are the people who are counted, right? There were no men left now from the original count. Well, women weren't counted in the original count. So we're not talking about them. No, says the says uh, the Medrash, the Sifrei, which Rashi is quoting. Be'ela lo ha'yish. Aval al hadashim lo nigzera gzerat hamaraglim. The women, the decree about over the, about about the spies, over the spies that the, everybody had to die in the desert. We thought that was everybody over twenty. No, not at all, says the Medrash. They loved Israel. They wanted to go into Israel. The men said, let's choose ahead and go back to Egypt. Give us a peace in the land of Israel. Give us an inheritance in Israel. And there's a whole discussion that even at this period, the men were still, right? There were some pieces, not only way back, the men were still saying they want to go back. Therefore, they're connected. And this connects to a whole vision of, in Chazal, which the Midrash Tanchuma then, this is in the Sifrei, but the Midrash Tanchuma elaborates, the women didn't do the golden calf, right? That's why uh, they, the men had to take their jewelry, the men, women didn't want to give them the jewelry to the golden calf, not because they were stingy, they were happy to give the jewelry afterwards to the, build the Mishkan, because they didn't want the golden calf. And the women wanted to get out of Mitzrayim, and they believed, and they went and had children. That's how we got out of Egypt. It's an entire theme, it's a whole motif, that the women in the desert are not represented by the stories you read. Those stories, that's history, and her story is that they had faith. They had faith they'd get out of Egypt. They didn't want to do the golden, make the golden calf, and they had faith they were going to Israel. So suddenly, the story of Benot Slavchad wanting to place in Israel and believing they were really going to get to Israel, and therefore thinking it was worth arguing about, yes, that story isn't the story of five, pe five people who happen to be women. That's about a whole culture of women who were just had a lot more grit. I know there's a few guys on the on this uh, uh, thing as well. So it's nothing about men today more than men, or women today, but it's an, and it's Chazal who are mostly male who are saying this. But that's their argument. That's why I'm calling it a feminist argument. Their argument is that is not this is not representative of those five people. This is representative of a culture of women of the time that believed they were going to get into Eretz Israel. So that's the first. Uh, argument that I say is adds a certain depth to this reading. The second one is number six here. Lama Yigara Shem Avinu. What was their argument about their father? They had an argument. They were arguing a lack of consistency within halacha. And that's why some of the people argue Moshe should have thought of it. Because they already knew the law of Yibum. Well, how they knew that is not so simple because it appears in Devarim. But guess Moshe had already taught the law of Yibum. And the law of Yibum says what? That generally a man cannot marry 
the widow of his brother. But if there are no children, yes, then he must take the widow of his brother and try to have children with her or give her a chalit. He has a choice, but he is connected and he has to go and do something about it. If the, it's if he has no children, not if he has no sons. So what they come and ask is, what is our status in halacha as women? If we count that if a man has daughters, he, his brother doesn't do yibum, then we count as the children of this man and we can carry on his name. So in that case, wait a minute, we should get an inheritance in Israel and carry on his name in Israel. Are we? Do we count? What is our real status within halacha as women? In other words, the question that's being asked is a question of the status of women in, in, in relationships of carrying on. Since we see that a man who has daughters does even one daughter, it doesn't matter, yes? The brother doesn't have to do yibum. He doesn't have to worry about does this man have a continuity. Yeah, he has a daughter. Then why can't we be his our father Tzlovcha's continuity and get a place in Eretz Yisrael? Right? Anu bin kom ben omdot. We stand in the place of a male. Im ein an the kevot chashuvot zela titiabemi menu liyabam. If that we're not, then let our mother remarry. The one of those brothers and and bring a, a boy's child to the world but it's a question of our status as women what exactly is it there seems to be a lack of clarity a lack of consistency here in our uh in our in understanding where we stand and this is where Hazal say why didn't moshe think of that problem um but maybe he did he didn't wasn't sure how to change it. I have to ask you for one moment. The getting too dark here. I have to put on a light. I apologize. I just needed to just just beginning to get a little dark here. Right. So that's my second what I'm calling feminist reading. It's seeing them as coming up with a question with a question that's coming from a questioning of what is the status of women in. Uh, in Jewish law. Okay, the third reading uh, is just, I don't know of any other piece like it, let's put it that way, in, uh, in Chazal. So can we get number seven nice and clear, Ilana? Can you scroll us up to number seven nice and clear? Is it large enough for everybody? Okay, this is not in Rashi. I think it was a little far from Shat for Rashi to bring it. It is in Midrash Sifrei, again, one of the earliest of our Midrash, Midrash, what we call Midrash Halacha, though it has a lot of Akada, Midrash Tanaim. In other words, the people quoted are going to be people like Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Yishma, uh, Hillel, Shami. This is, it's a, a Tanaidic Midrash. Vatikravna Belot Slavchad. What's this Vatikravna? They came close, close to where? To who? So the suggestion is they came close to each other. But it might be they came close to Moses. It might be they came close to God. I don't know. But ikravna benot slavchad, kevan she shamu benot slavchad, sha'aret mitchaleket lishvatim, velolen ikevot, nitkatsu kulan zo alzo litol etza. When they heard that the land was being divided by tribes, and that looks to them patriarchal, and therefore it's going to go according to the names here, and it doesn't look like women are getting. Any nachala, they get together, mitkarvot. They get close to each other. They get together to figure out what to do. They gather together to counsel, to take counsel. Yes. Um, okay. And now, what do they say? Amru, lo karachamei basav adam rachamei hamaka. Come. The the mercy of God is not like the mercy of human beings, or the mercy. Yeah, in that order. Human beings, they might have more mercy on males. Certainly, maybe males would have more mercy on males. I don't think today people have more mercy on males, but maybe in that culture. The one who spoke in the world came into being. Ain't okay, and he's not like that. 
אלא על הזכרים ועל הנקבות. It's, he has mercy on men and women, on males and females. Bachamav al akol, his mercy is on all. And here there's now some verses in brackets which are not in the translation because they're in the version that is, was in Sfaria just has the verse, Tov Hashem l'akol, v'rachamav al kol ma'asav, God is good to all and his mercies upon all his creations. However, a more correct version of the text actually includes some other pasuk, psukim. Notein lechem l'chol basar, he gives sustenance to all flesh. Notein l'fheima l'achma, he gives to the, to the behema its, its food, okay, to the animal kingdom, its food, i.e., what was their motivation? Not only their argumentation was different, what is their motivation? Are they thinking about their dad here? Or is it about something else altogether? Are they talking about, thinking about the fact that women should get nachalat so they don't starve, so somebody takes care of them if their father dies and there are no sons who would take care, take care of them, they should get it. The suggestion here is that their argument is not about their dad, but actually about something else. And their argument is, Torah is divine, it's not human, and therefore its value should be divine, and God must have rachamim on everybody, and give everyone sustenance, and therefore we're going to ask. Uh, quite an amazing little piece, according to Chazal, so now we might say, was that a positive thing? And the answer is yes, this is Sifrei, the same Sifrei that was bringing all the other positive arguments about them. That was saying they, they loved the land, that was saying they would tzad kaniyot like Yosef, it's all there. It was saying they saw what was in heaven and Moses didn't. It's the same Sifrei, and I give you an example here. Uh, Ilana, if you can scroll up. Here's an example. The next bit they say, right in the same verse, just as Joseph loved the land, they loved the land. There's this whole piece, which I actually missed out the Hebrew, which is the same as we saw in Rashi, really, that they, uh, in their generation, the men were saying, let's go back to Egypt, but the women were strong and were saying, let's go to Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so now we have the possibility that these women not only were coming as individuals in the name of the need of their father's name, but they were coming as women with a special love of Eretz Israel and a special belief they were going to make it. They were coming as women and saying, wait a minute, is there a problem and a consistency in what's going on? What is really our status? And they were coming as women saying, wait a minute, God cares equally about everyone. How can there be a problem? And this is quite I think it's quite surprising that that's the suggestion that, that they were coming very much as women with very strong claims and yet HaKadosh Baruch Hu said and the Midrash says they saw what was really written and they were right. Okay, so we have to somehow say how does this fit? Now I want to go on for a little bit and then give a chance to have some discussion. So if you can scroll down um, Skip number nine, Ilana, and scroll down. We'll get back to number nine, to number 10. How does this play out according to Chazal in Halacha? It really plays out. Because Chazal understand that the law that if there are no sons, a a, the daughter should inherit, becomes the law forever. Is this a temporary law for this time? Or is it Lederot Minai? Where do we know that no, it is a permanent fixture of halacha for all generations? Because it says, well, Bnei Yisrael to Daber Lemor. I don't know why that came out. Now this is another verse. It starts, it answers what Benot Slavcha to do. And then it starts again and says, and that's what should happen to future generations. Uh, that's verse... Um, um, seven and eight. Cain benot slav chatov wrote, give them the nachala, and then a new verse, verse eight, the el benes of the male to the bele, more, if a man dies without sons, give his inheritance to daughters. So that law is a law forever. However, 
However, what's about these B'nai Menashe who were not so happy about losing out that their tribe would lose its area? That seems to be very important in Chumash Bamidbar. Everybody's got to be in the right place in the desert and in the right place afterwards. Maybe it's a very valid argument. Say Chazal, maybe not. Let's go down and see what happens to their law. What's the law that comes at the end, yesterday at the very end of the Pasha? What was the law? The law was, if you get inherit, what should you do? Marry somebody from your tribe. Along comes the Gemara and says, mm, we're going to diminish this. So we think it got limited. It gets very severe limitations. Number 11. Amar Rav Yehuda Amar Shmuel, benot Slavchad, who truly nasei l'chol ha-shvatim. Actually, the daughters of Slavchad themselves, they could marry whoever they want. Because it says in the Pasuk, latov beinem tiyena l'nashim. Right? If you look at the end of Bamidbar, it says at the end there that they they can, um, uh, uh, chapter 36, verse 6. They can choose whoever they want, just it better be in their in the in the right shaver. That's how we read it. They can choose, which already is quite interesting, the suggestion that women could choose who they wanted to marry, and they should choose. They can choose who they want, but it should be from their tribe. Says uh Shmuel, no, they could choose whoever they want. Eitzah Tova, the idea it should be from the tribe. Eitzah Tova Histiana Katuv. That was a nice, a good, a good piece of advice. But actually, they could marry whoever they want. So the first limitation is that it didn't apply to Benot Slavchad themselves. They could marry whoever they want. Second limitation, even more interesting, and this uh, connects to this time of year. If you could scroll upward. Ilana, can you scroll upward? Okay. A little further, okay. Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel said, Lo hayu yamim tovim li Yisrael kachamisha sa ba'av ukiyom ha-kippurim. The best days of the year for, year for the Jewish people, they were two ba'av, the 15th of av, that's later next week after Tisha b'av, and Yom Kippur. Shebahen banot Yerushalayim yotot b'chlei lavan she'ulin shalol yavesh mitche'en lo. The women would go out dancing in white dresses so as not to embarrass. They used to borrow white dresses so as not to embarrass anybody who didn't have, and would go out dance. Okay, Milana, can you scroll further, please? Number 13. And here's the Gemara, a few pages later, on Daf Lamed, saying, what's that about? Okay. Yom Kippur Bishlama. I know why Yom Kippur is such a great day. Mishum de Itbe Slicha Umachila. We find it a very serious and scary day. They thought it was a wonderful day because it's the day that you're forgiven. Yom Shinit Nubo Luchotachwanot. That's when the second sent of Ten Commandments, Moses comes down from the mountain the second time. It's a day of forgiveness, Yom Kippur. It's a wonderful day. And by the afternoon, they went out there. Aval Chamisha Sabaav. But, but Chamisha Sabaav. Mayhi, what's so special about Hamisha Zabav? And then the Gemara gives a number of suggestions. Its first suggestion is, Ama Rav Yehuda, Ama Shmuel, Yom Shehitiru Shvatim Lavo Ze Beze. That was the day that they noticed that the generation that had come into Israel with Yehoshua was pretty much finished. The people had died. And now we were in a new generation, and therefore they allowed the men and women to marry in between tribes, including women who had inherited um, um, land. And they learned my They had some kind of drash of the pasuk, which is not a particularly strong drash. It's not used everywhere. But here there's a suggestion that they were able to judge that it says Zav Davar, and that was a temporary thing. Whatever it is, it's a very different story. The law that came in through Benot Slavchad was a law forever. The daughters inherit a father who doesn't have sons, 
And that applies also if it's the uncle and the brother then who doesn't have the father. It's not only the, the man who dies who doesn't have sense, but then if he has a brother, brother doesn't have sense, but he has a daughter, they would go to that daughter. Daughters inherit, all kinds of daughters inherit. The law that came in because the Menashe, B'nai Menashe came and said, wait a minute, this isn't fair. Now our, our land will be diminished. That was only temporary, just so when they get into Israel, it's clear where everybody lives. But actually, that as soon as that generation was had gone, that law fell away. So that, when you read Pshat, it looks like, well, you know, pull this side of the rope, pull that side of the rope. The women, okay, they got that they inherit, but then they have to marry only certain people. No, that's not how Chazal understood it. They understood that what came through Benot Slavchad was major, and what came through them was a minor need for that time. And maybe that was specific to their question. And now, Ilana, if you can just scroll back to number nine. Okay. This is the version, something we saw in Rashi. It's the version um, that appears originally in the Sifrei. Vayom Hashem Moshe came benot slavchat wrote. They, the daughters of Tzlavchad, the English wrote rightly, but I would like Yafez beautifully, but you could say rightly. So the Pasha is written in front before me in the Marom, in this Torah that precedes maybe the whole creation of the world, whatever that means. And yeah, it's another, it's a different shiur. Right. It exists already, this idea. It's not coming because they asked for it. That's not, it's not, the law exists. It's coming into the world because they asked for it. But it exists before me. It is the right. And then there's a second piece. Ashrei Adam Makom Model Blessed is somebody or happy is someone who God um, acknowledges his, what he says. Kayot Sebo, Atalmer. Similarly, it says, Cain Beno Yosef of him. It says the same thing. They asked appropriately too. Kayot Sebo, Vayomi Hashem Salachti Gifarecha. God says to Moses, I forgave as in your word. On this, you could see that Rashi split up the two issues, and both the uh, commentary of the Nesi, the Tziv and the Todot Adam two major commentaries on the Sifre, both say similar things. So I uh, I sort of just gave you a short, uh, an abridged version. Lo shakach k'tuvah pasha lefanai b'maron. The similarity for the b'nai, don't read this wrong, they say. There are two different ideas in the Medrash. The first idea is that was the pasha that's in the heavens. That's how Torah should be. And the Benot Slavchad with their question, bring it into the world. The second idea is it's very nice if God says, okay, to what you say. The, the, where it says that, Kayotsebo B'nei Yosef, uh, came B'nei Yosef to Rim, that's only about the second idea that God said, okay. It's not about the first idea. The idea that they should have to marry within their tribe that wasn't written in Hashem's Torah in the heaven because that was a temporary the law that came in because they asked for it and will go out again of halacha. Just for that period of coming into Israel because they asked, Hashem said, okay, they were machadashit. Whereas the women weren't machadash something, they saw something that was supposed to be that was there as part of Torah. And theirs was not, but a, it's not a pasha lefanai b'marom. It's not there in the heavens because it's a temporary need which Hashkodesh Baruch Hu allows for now, but in actual fact, not part of the grand vision of halacha. So where do we get with all that? So um, I want to suggest that we go further than we did at the beginning. In the first half, what I suggested is we could clearly acknowledge that there was validity and some kind of wonder and magnificence to people asking. That it could happen even in the time of Moshe, that the Torah wanted 
kept something back that Moshe wouldn't know in order to validate, and did it the same thing with Korban Pesach, in order to validate the questioning, the process of questioning. That's as far as we got in the first one. But here what we get to, I think is, is beyond that, and to many questions which remain unresolved, which is that here, Chazal is suggesting that the motivation is much more complex than we said at the beginning. There are a number of factors coming in here. There's the honor of the father. There's the love of Eretz Yisrael. There's the question of the status of women in halacha. There's the question of remembering that halacha is divine. And therefore, that when one thinks halacha, one has to try to get close to what a Kurdish Baruch would want in the world, not just what we would like in the world. All those kind of things got added in uh, through this, um, suggesting that they were speaking of wi as women in that time. And I think what it suggests is that questioning is important, as we said, motivation is important, but motivation is complex and not so easy for anybody to be the judge on the outside as to what was an appropriate or inappropriate motivation, because Chazal here thinks that, th think that a, a really an interesting combination of things are appropriate motivations and appropriate ways of thinking and looking to see is there consistency here was an appropriate way of thinking and looking to see is there rachamim here is an appropriate way of thinking when one's thinking about Allah. And the other thing that gets added to the complexity is that there are different types of questioning and different types of answers. And there are questions that will lead to a temporary divergence in halacha, which will be something for this time that's necessary at this time, but it actually will not be part of lasting halacha. And we have that. We have takanot that don't last, for instance. We have changes that actually there's a number of ways halacha could go and there are a number of attempts and they may be all okay, but the mainstream of halacha will eventually choose a path between those different paths. And that we see that in the sense that what, what uh, Benot Slav Chat bring becomes permanent or always was meant to be permanent, however you see it. And what the B'nai Yosef bring is only temporary. It doesn't rise to the point of being permanent. And the problem is solved by that, that, all right, the, the different tribes will not keep their areas as distinct. Maybe with time, they're not meant to keep their areas as distinct anyway. Maybe there's actually something better in this lack of keeping things distinct. And maybe that's something, actually, I had a conversation with Viva. We were together at a Brit on Friday, Viva Zomba, and she was talking about maybe that was something that women are bringing, actually. And there's this movement of what they're bringing, this, this more connectedness is actually the more positive thing, even though it's a little bit anarchical. In other words, there's, if we come back to the book of Bamidbar, there's all these structures and strictures, and there's sometimes a sense of anarchy that gets uh, throws, uh, thrown in that creates um, something, new patterns. And actually the anarchy is allowed According to Chazal, the end of the book is actually a temporary uh, structure that will actually be opened up to far, something far more open. Not the way I read it, the Pshat, before. So with that, I want to open up to the anarchy that will come from our questioning, are you, all the questions. I'm sorry that I'm not able, I know some people can read chats as they speak, I can't do it. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Ilana that you actually, if you can, record the, the chats uh, so I can see them afterwards and connect, uh, think about them some more. Um, uh, I see there are lots of interesting things going on, but I'd like to open it up if somebody wants to uh, actually uh, say what they said in the chat for all of us to share it with us now verbally um, or however, I'd be uh, um, very happy. Um, uh, so would li anybody like to uh, make a suggestion as to just, or even repeat something they put in the chat so we can put it on the table. Sybil, come on. I didn't put anything in the chat because I'm just uh, 
fascinated and in awe uh, by the way you unpack this. Um, one of the, one of my recurring thoughts about the note Slav Hud has always been the opening word, Vatikravna. Um, because Vatikravna means they drew near. That's a simple shot meaning. Um, I love the fact that you interpret it as they drew near to each other to discuss the problem. The other way of looking at it is you see the word Krav in there, which suggests tension. Very nice. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, well, Krav is battle. Um, so you wonder whether they were coming to Moshe, as somebody said, uh, in a demanding way. Um, and I love the fact that the way you've interpreted has resolved that, that in fact, there is some tension, but it's a kind of tension which managed to get resolved in a very creative way. Yes, I think once you said that, Sybil, I want to go with the word krav also in terms of the word like korban and uh, they were willing to sacrifice. They were sacrificing something by doing this. It was a pretty bold thing to do. Yeah. And um, when I was talking to another friend today, she talked about um, uh, uh, Slavchad, the name Slavchad as meaning sale of Pachad. And it's not clear what he had done wrong, but there's a, a shadow of fear. And they, if, if there is in his name the words shadow of fear, they go beyond that and they're not in the shadow of fear. And whether the word Karav, um, uh, uh, we, there's a beautiful Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah that says, we say to the Chazan, Krav, and we mean sacrifice yourself, go close to God, and do our battle for us, like when Abraham stepped forward. So I think you, you're right to, to focus on this word, Vatikravna. It's really uh, very, very beautiful. It's, it's uh, possibilities of meaning um, all packed in that one little word um, in terms of what could happen. But I think they do, they do take a risk. There is a risk that they take by doing this. Um, it's a very big risk. They could get misinterpreted. They could get, um, and uh, I mean, you could say they have nothing to lose, but it's not true. They have their status, they have who they are. And, uh, and uh, there's a, even a Tanhuma that talks about them as it being praiseworthy that they took so long to get married and were choosy about who they married. And mm -hmm. they, uh, and, and say, Batovlem, let them choose who they want to marry. That they, they see them as women who who um, who took a path, uh, uh, their own path. I think. Thank you, Sibyl. Yes, Nami. I think on the one hand, there was some risk to their Hitkarev to Moshe and to raise this question. On the other hand, I think that there were they could be seen also as representative of a lot of other families where there were only daughters. B'nai Israel was quite large. The thought of only one family with only daughters is, just doesn't work. Absolutely. So, so whether they knew they were representing, they probably did. They probably had friends. And they were the ones who, who represented all of their sisters and cousins and whatever, who also were families of only one. Right. There, there are commentators who say that that's why Chazal have so much difficulty with Moshe not knowing the answer, because it's such a basic a question. It's not an uh, odd little thing on the side. There must have been a lot of men, even with polygamy, there must have been a lot of men who happened to have daughters. And so they were asking for all these women. They were asking for their sake and, for, um, and coming forward <laughs> for them. Yes. There's also the word, the word karev is also used when Moshe describes how the people came to him asking for spies. So it is, a, it, it is a confrontative word there as well. Yes. And it's, I think they use it again. Uh, there's also the Bnei Yosef use it. It's used about them. They also, in other words, coming, coming close, it's like the word vayigash in Bereshit about Abraham. When it says vayigash, does it mean to confront God, to be co com combative, to be to, to ask? Is it a, c a case of closeness, of intimacy? And uh, one of the commentators there in the midrash says it's all of them, and maybe we could say it was the same thing with them. They're coming in a certain amount of combative mode, and at the same time, they're coming from a sense of within of love. 
They, they love the love for their father, the love for the land of Israel. There, there's maybe the love for the other women who are also in their position. There's um, both aspects in this world, word as there was in Vayigash. Um, uh, but I was, I had never till this week when I had, when you did choose the most challenging of the subjects, really worked through the extent in the, in the Gemara, the way the Gemara concludes, not at all according to the Peshat at the end of the Parsha. At the end of the book, you think, well, women got something and gave them, no. And that's not how Chazal see it at all. They see what they exactly. saw as what great happens needs. To us. And uh, the others as, well, okay, you, you need your needs, we'll, we'll give it to you at this point. How many times in terms of what happens in halacha, that's amazing. Adina, did you want to say something? Yes. You, now you have to unmute. You need to unmute. Press the space bar. Press the okay, I got it. You know, this is not my forte, this whole thing. And we had to use AT&T because we don't have any internet. Anyway, does it matter that the five women stood together? Does anybody make note of the fact that they were really like one? Not anybody spoke a different language. They all spoke the same exact language, all wanted the same thing. It's hard to, it's hard to even think about where five women will stand together and say the same exact thing. <laughs> so I think that I didn't bring all of the Sifre because I had to choose. Um, the, the Medrash and Rashi quotes, it talks about the fact that their names are not in the same order because they were really all uh, equally uh, great human beings. Um, but the fact that it says Vatikrava means they take counsel, I think relates to that question. They couldn't all come before Moshe unless they sat together and talked about it first and thought about it together. And then it doesn't say who was the spokesperson or spokeswoman here. I don't know if one of them was spoke all the time. It doesn't actually say. And I think that the text is giving you the sense that there is a real connection between them, that, they, that, they, um, that they're coming as, as, as a family. A family. I thought that I was a quite, I don't have any sisters, but- Quite not nice that five right. women could do that. Right, but they're sisters and they're coming as sisters together. Um, not all sisters get along. That's true, but you know, I don't have any sisters, so I think all sisters get along. Um, but uh, um, uh, I think, I think uh, the text, by changing the order of their names, I think kind of hints to you that they're coming as a group. That's what the suggestion and is. This, keeps changing. Does any, of your sheer, does any of your sheer relate to Naomi and Ruth with the inheritance that they also did not really get? Where the daughters, I mean, she had to go to, do. to her uncle and, you know, and take care of them and all of that. Does that relate at all? It does because they, did they, not were, had, because they were daughters-in-law, they weren't daughters. Had they been daughters, they could have just come back and taken it and taken the land. Mm -hmm. But they were daughters-in-law and therefore there was the problem. And, and again, this law doesn't apply to, it doesn't change everything. It doesn't make exactly equivalent the, the situation for men and women. And that wasn't really what they were asking for. We have to go back to say that their question was, why should the name of a father not continue? The name of the family. That the name of the family can go through the daughter, but that it first went through the man. Now, you have to remember that when it comes to anything monetary, Chazal understood that you can make, you can change things. And so many things can be, are changed, have been changed, can be changed. Um, when it comes to Shabbos, you can't move it to Tuesday. And when it comes to the laws of marriage, it's harder to change things. But any, all the things that are, that have to do with this kind of uh, civil law actually can be changed very easily. And that's another sheer as to why Chazal thought that could be so, but they do. So a lot of this can be easily changed. Anybody can write a will today and give their, what their, their, belongings equally to their sons and daughters, for instance, there's no problem halachically, there's ways you do it, but there's no problem halachically to do so. Um, but this is saying what has to be that they, that when there wasn't a, a son to give it to the daughter. Um, well, just, just to tell everyone, you're still very amazing. <laughs> I just want to, see, first of all, again, thank you. It's so wonderful to join you. I, I enjoy joining you so much. And I hope one day we'll be able to do it again in Boston. Or maybe Mashiach will come first, you'll all be here. But if not, I hope to do it in Boston. But I also I also want to say that somebody put on the chat, well, how does it relate to today? And, and I think that is the big challenge. Because it's true that we can't say, all right, 
uh, the postic will go as God, and he isn't God, and he may make big mistakes. And but I think it relates in a number of ways. It relates in terms of the validity of questioning and the importance of educating yourself when you want to ask questions. Right? The Chazal here are suggesting they knew they compared it to Yibum. Get yourself inside. Rav Nachum Binowitz had a beautiful idea. When something bothers you, look hard. You're not the, it didn't bother, it bothers you because of your conscience. It's there before. It's bothered somebody else before. It's bothered in the Chumash. It's bothered in Chazal. Go and learn. When something bothers you, go and learn. And then approach and ask a question. And it's a very strong statement to Poskin to really listen and to understand that there are things that they don't see from their vantage point of where they're looking, and they can only really paskin when they hear others. It's like a doctor who doesn't do a good diagnosis unless they listen to the patient, right? They, they can't, they're not there, they're, they're in those shoes. And that I think it's also a message to, to uh, look for a posek who has these qualities, who's able to say, let me think about it, let me ask, who's able to say, rachamab al and I think uh, it's also on the questioner to look for Poskin who, who, can, who they feel can hear them. But um, it's also a very strong statement to Poskin. And I know that Rav, Rav Amital, uh, uh, who was, Allah uh, Shalom, who was the Rosh Yeshiva together of Ruchelstein in the Gush, took this piece very seriously and talked about it as a Posek, right? So there are Poskin who are, are using it in that kind of way. Uh, to say, um, what kind of question is this? What way can it be listened to? Can it make some sort of permanent change? Can it be, maybe make only a temporary change? What what can be done here? But the mo the strongest issue is that that you're supposed to question. That's like way out. But that's what they're saying. You're supposed to go out there. You're not supposed to just say, okay, 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 okay. Um, you're supposed to ask questions. So. Uh, and even when you ask them not so well, the posik is supposed to try to hear what you're saying beyond the tone. Um, um, that's what's going on here. And that's what Rav Abi Amitav wanted to say. So, Mir um, uh, we should be able to use these ideas to, to help ourselves work out where we want to question and how we want to question and how we want to strive towards something. Okay.